Hello and welcome to 13th Age Character Creation. This is probably going to be a very long video. We're going to go through how to create a 13th Age character and we're going to work through some of the rules, some of the mechanics of, of playing, some general advice about 13th Age. If you have been invited to play in a 13th Age game or you know, you're just wondering about the rules because you want to run it, whatever it may be, congratulations. 13th Age is a wonderful game. I enjoy it a lot. As I said, this video... It's probably going to take quite a while, so sit back, relax, and enjoy 17 uninterrupted hours of smooth jazz. Okay, so I got my rule book here. We're only going to be using the core rule book here. We're not going to be using any of the classes in 13 True Ways or any of the other supplements because I want to keep it simple. The classes in the supplement typically follow the same structure as character creation here. I do recommend reading the class that you want to play pretty thoroughly because some of these classes are going to have a lot going on, like the commander, the monk, rogue, like they all have like different things that you need to track. Don't expect your GM to track all those things for you. Don't be that person. Um, read the class and, and work through it. But, but you'll get it because the game is very good about just telling you what you need to, what you need to do. Okay, so I got my core rule book. I got my character sheet that I grabbed off of the Pelgrane Pla Press website, and we're good to go. So we're going to start by going to Chapter 2, Character Rules, and we have our character creation checklist here. Game Master input, um, first and most important thing, make sure that you're creating a character that's a good fit for the world. Learn a little bit about the world that you're going to be playing in because that's also going to greatly impact your backgrounds, your one unique thing, all of the narrative things that 13th Age does really well. Excuse me. We're going to pick out a race, pick out a class. We're going to generate our abilities. You can do this like D&D. You can roll for it or do a point by. Personally, I'm not going to do any math, so I'm just going to use a, a standard array. Uh, we're going to generate our combat stats, which this works differently from D&D. In D&D, you have your armor class. Here you have your armor class, but you also have two other types of defenses, which are your physical defense and your mental defense. And we're going to calculate the numbers for those. It's all pretty, pretty straightforward. Then we're going to get into the things that make 13th Age unique, which is your one unique thing, the one thing that makes you special, unique in this entire world, the only character to whatever. We're going to go through icon relationships and backgrounds, which are all very narrative things with some mechanic influence on the game. And of course, all of the class-related things like feats, talents, traits, gear, all those things. Cool. So I think that we are going to go for a half-orc ranger for this build. So we are going to get a plus two racial bonus and a plus two class bonus. So the thing to remember here is that you can't double dip. So let's say that half orcs, they get plus two to either dexterity or strength, and rangers also get a plus two to either dexterity or strength, or also wisdom, I believe. You can't have a plus four on any one of those abilities. You have to choose different things. So let's just start there and also generate our ability points. So to generate our ability points, we can either roll for them or we can use point by. As I said earlier, I don't want to do any math. So I'm just going to go over to the appendix here where we have a bunch of these stat arrays. All of these are 28 points, so they will comply, you know, with the, with the point by system. Personally, when I'm running this game, I don't let my players roll for it. I just have them either do point by or use one of these arrays. Little sip of coffee. Okay, so let's go over to our character sheet. My name is going to be Thrasilus. Thrasilus. And our race is half orc. Class is ranger. Level one. Level, incredibly important, of course, in every game, but in 13th Age, you add your level to a lot of the roles and you get. So much more powerful for every level that, that you get that it is really, really important to track. That's redundant. You track your levels at every game. Okay, so 
I'm going to be using this array here and let's check where we get our bonuses. So first let's go to chapter three races and we said we want it to be a half orc. So half orcs, they get a plus two to strength or to dex and also we get our lethal racial power. Let's see on this character sheet, racial power. We get lethal. Let's just note that down there. You want to have all these things handy on your character sheet. We're going to talk about what that champion feat means in a sec. But we get lethal once per battle, we get to reroll a melee attack and use the roll that we prefer as the result. Nice. Okay, so we get either a plus two to strength or to dexterity. Let's see what we get from our ranger. I believe that it's also strength and dexterity. So we're going to go to classes here on chapter four, and let's take a look at the ranger. And we can see here in ability scores, plus two bonus to strength, dexterity, or wisdom. Yeah, so I think, I think I'm going to go for plus two on strength and plus two on dexterity, and I think I'm going to go higher on dexterity. So let's take a look here. We said this is the stat array that we want to go with. All right, so 18, let's put that 18 in dex. And that's going to be a 20 because we got a plus 2. 20 gives us a plus 5 modifier where there's a table where you can see all the all the modifiers. And I'm going to put the 18, no, sorry, the 16 on strength, and that's actually going to be an 18, which gives us a plus four modifier, because we, we got our plus two on our strength. So we got an 18 on our strength. And I think the other ones, we had a 10. That 10, I'm either going to put it in wisdom or in constitution. So constitution is going to impact my hit points. But the ranger also has some wisdom stuff, but I think I'm going to go for constitution. And then let's see, the other ones are all eights. So we got eight, eight, eight. A 10, I think, is a plus zero. And the eights will give me minus ones, which I'm now, as I'm working through it, and thinking ahead, is not going to be great for our ranger. So let's go back to the character creation checklist. You have all the modifiers here, right? You cannot buy 20 with your points, but you can buy up to 18 and then you can get it up to 20 with your plus two, which is what we did with, with our ranger here. And you have all the modifiers here. You also have, you know, the formula to calculate it out by yourself. Yeah, but I, I just used the, the table. Now that we have our ability scores, let's move on to our hit points and all of our defenses. So first level hit points. Find the base value for your class. You have it on page 76. So here's page 76 where we have all the classes. And we're going to be using a bunch of these numbers here. And we're going to be using this table quite a bit. So base HP, your usual base armor class. All this means is that the armor class here is with the type of armor that this class typically takes. So for rangers, this is like light leather armor. For paladin, this might be like heavier armor, stuff like that. You can go to the each individual class and see, you know, what, what are the options there? Typically, you have an option to take maybe a better AC, but then that comes at a cost of a penalty to, to attack rolls. So Ranger starts at 7 HP. That was the number that we wanted to grab here. Let's go back to our character creation checklist and take a look here. So we got our 7 base HP. You add your constitution modifier and you multiply that by 3 to get your starting hit points. So our constitution modifier is a big fat 0. So it's just 7 times 3. So that's going to be 21 for our starting hit points, which is not amazing, but you know, we'll power through. All right, so those are our hit points. For armor class, we need to find our ace AC value. So we saw on that chart that it was 14 for rangers. 
let me just show you what this looks like and what your options are. So let's go to classes, let's go to Ranger. And if I scroll down here, you see that under armor, Rangers prefer leather armor, scuffed and camouflage, blah, blah, blah. So it has the light armor, which has the 14 AC. This is kind of like the normal one. You're usually not going to go with none unless there's like a narrative thing where, you know, you're starting without any equipment. If you're going to go heavy, you are doing that with a penalty, right? So minus two to your attacks. If you also take a shield, that is an additional minus two to your attacks. So I don't want to do any of that. I would just want to go with 14. And by the way, on each individual class, you also have a page that will show you a progression table with all of the things that you get on each level and all of these stats that we're calculating out here. So how to calculate out your armor class, physical defense, mental defense, hit point, like all of this is neatly organized in one place using the checklist on purpose just to, I guess, I don't know, show you the, the long way around. So let's go back to our character rules here. So for let's just take a look at these and then we'll go back to, you know, the individual page for for the ranger just to keep things easy. So for armor class, we know that it's 14. That's our base. And then we need to find the middle value between our constitution, dexterity and wisdom modifier and use the middle one as our AC modifier. And then we add our level to that. And that's going to be our AC. So con dex with Let's see, um, con, dex, and whiz it was, right? So we have a zero, a plus five, and a minus one. So that is a zero, right? The middle between those three will be a zero. And we add plus one for our level. So that means that we are at a total of 15, right? For our armor class, right? We started 14 plus zero which is the middle value there, plus one for our armor class. Now let's do the same for our physical and mental defense. I want to go to the ranger handy little table there. For physical defense, we have 11 plus the middle mod of strength con dex. So strength con dex, the middle here is going to be a plus four, right? Between a zero plus five and plus four, the middle is going to be a plus four. So it was... 11 plus 4 is 15 plus our level is 16, which is not bad. That was our physical defense and our mental defense is 10 plus intelligence, wisdom, charisma. So intelligence, wisdom, charisma, we have a minus 1 on all of them. So this is basically 10 minus 1 for the modifier plus 1 for the level. So that keeps us at 10, which is not great, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll power through. Let's see what else. Hit points, we already calculated out. Recoveries. So the way that healing works in 13th age is that you have your recovery die. In our case, it's going to be a, a D8. That's our recovery dice. And every time that you heal, let's say you take the rally action or someone gives you a healing potion or heals you, whatever, you use one of your recoveries. And there are also things that could give you free recoveries. And then between full heal-ups, which is sort of the equivalent of a long rest in, in D&D, the recoveries become very precious. It becomes a very precious resource. It leads to a lot of really dramatic situations. I really like it. It looks just like... Um, uh, hit dice at first, but it actually is, I think, a cooler mechanic than that. So at first, we will get eight recovery dice. I love that it says probably eight. We'll talk about this in just a sec. We get eight recoveries, and our recovery dice is 1d8 times our level. Now our level is one, so it's just going to be 1d8 plus our constitution modifier, which in our case is a big fat zero. So we have eight out of eight recoveries and we're rolling a 1d8 plus zero it says probably eight because sometimes you can take talents or other things that will give you more recoveries so for example specifically with the ranger if you take an animal companion that gives you two extra recoveries because you know you're recovering for two 
Okay, so we got all of that, all of the basics down pretty much. And we can move on to the class specific stuff. You know what, let's do the class specific stuff, the talents and, and the feats, and then we'll have plenty of time to go over the things that make 13th age, 13th age, which is the, you know, one unique thing, the background, all of that stuff. Okay, so I'm going to scroll up here a little bit just to take a look at the the weapons and gear. So I have my basic attacks here for the ranger. Melee attack does either strength or dexterity, which is great for us because we have good dexterity here. And then the damage is the weapon damage plus our strength modifier. And our miss damage is just equal to our level and very similar for the ranged attack. So we need to pick out the the weapons that we want. The cool thing here, at least from my perspective uh, as a GM, all that really matters here is the damage dice, right? Other than this, as a GM, I would tell my players, like, flavor this however you want. Like, all that matters here is the damage dice, you know, pick whichever one kind of works for you. There's also some nice rules for dual weapon fighting. We're not going to get into that right now, but you could definitely do two one-handed short swords or whatever makes sense for you. So let's say, for example, that we're going for this short sword, this one-handed short sword, and our attack will be, we'll use dexterity because that's higher for us. So dexterity plus level versus AC. So our attack is right now it's going to be it's a d20 plus five plus level versus ac you can write you know just the level but then you'll have to go back and update it each time you level up so this is just one way to write this write this however you want but this is going to be basically our plus six to attack at least at level one and we hit on 1d6 and our miss is level. That's our basic melee attack and you can fill this out for your ranged attack as well. Let's see what else. And uh, yeah, a bit more about the gear here. Yeah, 13th age tends to kind of like hand wave away a lot of like the basic equipment, which D&D for example doesn't and I find incredibly boring, right? Like I don't want to I don't want to deal with how much rope you have. You you have rope right? Whatever. Some players like that. I, I don't mean to like knock it. Magic items are pretty cool in this game because those are the items that we actually care about. Magic items that do cool stuff. Okay, that's a separate thing. Let's keep going. So we are going to go back here to the ranger level of progression. And as I said, every class is going to have this type of table that's going to tell you exactly what you get. So in this case, level one, total hit points, we already did that. We get one adventure level feat, and we get three class talents. So let's pick out our class talents first, because that will also give us an opportunity to talk about feats. Choose three of the following talents. You get an additional ranger class talent at fifth level and then at eighth level. So here you'll find both the specific talents for your class and also the unique feats for your class. Unless the GM has told you otherwise, you will need the base talent in order to get the feat. And also, you do not automatically get the adventure level feat if you get the base talent. So what I mean by this is that let's say now we're going to take archery. And that will mean that once per battle, we get to re-roll one of our missed ranged attacks. That is all we get right now. We do not automatically get the adventurer feat. If I want to, I can use my one adventurer feat that I get now to take this adventurer feat and make archery even better. Maybe I won't do that. Maybe I'll do something else, but but that's that's the way it works. If your GM allows you to take a feat that's related with a talent without taking the talent, if it makes sense for the talent, great, go for it. Usually, these feats will be built upon the foundation of, of the talent. Okay, so Animal Companion takes two Ranger class talent slots. So if we were to take Animal Companion, we could only take one other talent. I don't want to get into the rules for Animal Companion now, so we're just going to take Archery. 
so we have our talents here so we're going to take archery and we can paste the description for it here so it'll be handy and we'll remember let's also do double no because we have the melee thing let's see when fighting with two one-handed no i don't know i don't know if that's the one i want to do it's funny it's like even i know i'm never i'm probably not going to play this character i'm just doing it as an example i still i can't just like randomly choose like i have to actually build it so we'll do favored enemy because that is cool and i also like i think this one is the one i like once per battle as a free action choose an enemy the crit range on your attacks against that enemy expands by two yeah i like uh i like this one so we'll do lethal hunter i like the the stuff that expands your crit range so basically if you expand your crit range by two, that now means you can crit on like an 18 instead of a instead of a 20. Okay, cool. So we got our stuff here. You also have your, all of your animal companion rules, but that is very specific to the ranger. So we're not going to get into that right now. And we still get one feat. So we said you can take the feats here for any of the talents that we took, but there are also general feats. So let's go back to chapter two character rules and we have feats here there's also a nice table here that tells you this is what the feat is and this is why you would want it and then you have like a bunch of them here i'm not going to go through all of them let's take improved initiative as our one adventure tier feat that gives us a plus four to our initiative checks so I'm going to take improved initiative that gives us a plus four. So here, because of with a lot of these roles, you always add your level to them. So for example, if I'm doing a strength roll, I'm going to roll a d20 plus four for my modifier and plus one for my level. Um, right now we're level one. So I trust us to, you know, remember that one plus four is five, but uh, same goes for initiative. So for initiative, our initiative would be six, right? Because we have our dexterity modifier plus five, plus one for our, our current level. But because I just took improved initiative, we get a plus four on top of that. So we're gonna be at a plus 10 initiative, which is great. So this is a great thing to do, like if you're a rogue, but I, I just like this feat in general. And then for the rest of these, you would just fill out, you know, the the way you would roll. So for example, for all of these ones, you would get like the plus one from your level. So the modifier here would be zero, right? So just important to, to remember. Or for this one, it would be a plus one. Cool. That's all the basics done. There's plenty more to talk about, but this is really the, the basics that, that we need to do. I didn't go over stuff like, you know, how much gold you have, like all of that is listed out there. Now let's talk about the things that make 13th Age unique which are all of the uh, the narrative stuff so let's go back to our character creation overview here we chose our race we chose our class we generated our abilities we generated our combat stats we did all of our we put in our recoveries all of our attacks our powers our talents all that stuff we did all of it amazing time for our one unique thing in 13th age Characters are main characters. Something that D&D 5th edition, for example, does very well is the ragtag group of, you know, nobodies that become heroes over time and like slowly transition into gods on their journey from level 1 to level 20. 13th Age doesn't do that very well. 13th Age starts you off as a badass character that can do a lot of stuff, has been around, usually is somewhat already important in the world, obviously depending on the type of game that you're trying to play. But you just saw, even you know, with one of the most basic classes, there's a lot of stuff you can already do on level one, right? So um, 13th Age is really for those big damn heroes. Each character gets to pick their one unique thing. This is a narrative thing that you choose. It should not make you stronger mechanically. This should be a purely narrative thing that you and the GM agree on that, is, that 
will create some interesting interaction in the game. So you have some examples here, but you need to make this up with your GM. So I actually, some of these ones I don't think are very good. Like I'm a former cultist. I don't think it's a very good one unless it is like, I'm the only half orc to have ever been a part of this cult. Something like this, like something that makes it unique. I am a deathless pirate whose soul is trapped in a gem controlled by the blue dragon, right? Maybe this is even something that can change the course of an adventure. Adventure. I am the bastard son of the emperor. I'm the oldest elf in the world. It could even be something like silly, like I make like objectively the best pancakes in this entire world. Sometimes you'll go sessions and sessions without the the unique coming into play at all, and that is fine, but I promise you that there will come a time where it will be amazing, right? So the one unique thing, let the concept of your character guide you. Usually I like it when my players do choose something that's a bit more serious and like has to do with with their icons, for example, and has to do with the concept of the characters. But really, there are a lot of really great examples here. Choose something that is the reason that your character is unique in this world. If you go to the one unique thing section of, of the book, they have plenty more examples. I see dead people. But they also give you an overview for what these one unique things might be. No combat bonuses, no combat powers. Like, you can say, I'm the world's best sword fighter, and then expect to get, you know, pluses on all your sword fighting tests, whatever. And also, work with your GM on this. Don't try to, like, you know, weasel your way into bonuses. This is more about telling a really compelling story rather than trying to get more dice to to roll. This is usually a little hard for new players to wrap their mind around. I I don't remember they have something in here. I don't remember exactly where it is, but they have something in here somewhere on this page where it's like yeah, some some players are always going to try to get cute with this, but yeah, you know what I'm saying. Characters uniques can grow, they can evolve over time. Also, I would say if you're working through your backgrounds after this and you see that the the thing that you want to do with your backgrounds is kind of changing what the unique thing might be, go back and change it. So let's do that right now. Let's do our icon relationships and then let's do our, our backgrounds. So icons in 13th age are essentially... Oh, here it is, deliberately pushing it. <laughs> There's a fuzzy line with uniques that some players will insist on pushing. If you have a player who insists that their character's cool story-based unique essentially amounts to a combat-relevant power they want to define, you can work with that, but you need to make it clear to everybody involved that the character is going to pay a price. I would say, like my advice, don't even go there. Do not let your players, or if you're a player, don't do this try to push for uniques that impact the mechanics of the game because it's just not going to be a good time unless it's kind of like very thematic to the game. Okay, I went on and on about this for for way too long. Icons in 13th Age are basically the big NPCs that are the movers and shakers of this world. These are the archetypes of tropes that you've seen in any fantasy game. So, for example, there's an icon called the Elf Queen. That's Galadriel, right? The Lich King, the Emperor. There's the Great Gold Worm, which is basically a dragon that is physically blocking demons from coming from the abyss into the world. They have some lore for this. In my personal game, I've changed some of the icons. I've stolen some of the icons from like other materials. It doesn't really matter, right? Like you don't have to use the exact icons that they have in this book. You can make up your own. What matters is that uh, how they impact the story. So for example, if you have this sort of like empire or if you have like an undead king or if you have the king of the druids, whatever it may be, explain that to your players. If you're the GM, if you're a player, try to understand who are the icons of this world and use that to shape your character. So for example, the way this works is that you have three points to invest 
in the relationships with these icons. So let's say, for example, the icons that you are interested in are the emperor, and this usually doesn't represent a direct relationship with the icon themselves. It's usually a relationship with one of the many organizations that work under them. So let's say you are coming up with the concept of someone who used to be a high-ranking member of the city watch that served under the emperor in the like main imperial city, and, and you want to represent that with your icon relationship. So let's say you're putting two points into your relationship with the emperor. Those points can be either positive, conflicted, or negative. Let me first explain how this works mechanically. At the beginning of every session, you will roll a number of D6s equal to the amount of points you have with each icon. So if you invested two points with the Emperor, for example, you'll roll two D6 for your relationship with the Emperor. And for every five that you get, that is called an ambiguous success. So it's like something good will happen, but there'll be a price for it. And for every six you roll, that is an unambiguous success. That is clearly something good will happen for you, even if that point is a negative point with that icon. So let's take a look at an example. Let's say that you are a high-ranking member of the city watch in the Imperial City, you know, whatever. You take two positive points with the Emperor because of the high-ranking status that you might have had there. Now we're starting to, like, shape a story about this ranger maybe that will also impact the type of background that that I have. I'm a ranger, right? I'm not a fighter or I'm not a commander. So maybe at some point something happened and then I left the the city guard and I, you know, fell in with like a a bad crowd or something. So let's say that I have I still have my two positive points with the emperor because I served there. I was honorably discharged after a really like good career and that means that you know i i could use those relationships to to my advantage maybe sometimes at a price but to my advantage and then let's say that after i left after i left the city guard i wanted to i wanted to seek some sort of like ancient artifact that will allow me to bring someone back from the dead or something like that I just watched the D&D movie, so I'm like stealing some things from there. So let's say I want to get this artifact that will help me bring someone back from the dead. And in so doing, I fell in with the cults of the Lich King, right? But at some point I said like, hey, I'm not a bad guy. I'm a good guy. And I double crossed them. So I have one negative relationship point with the Lich King. That still means that if I roll a six on my relationship with the Lich King that I in those D6s that I roll in the beginning of every session, that is still necessarily going to be a positive thing for me. Like something helpful will result from the fact that I have a negative relationship with the Lich King. So this means that maybe I find a common enemy. It means that maybe like I get them somehow. But we use these icon relationships to shape the story of the character. Also, as a GM, if you're the GM and you're watching this, you can use these roles at the beginning of every session to kind of shape the the things that will happen in this session. So let's say that um, someone was kidnapped and the players are kind of going after the people who kidnapped them. And they find out that the kidnapped person was handed off to another group and is now going to a second location. In the beginning of the session, let's say that three of your players rolled their icon dice and got successes, ambiguous or otherwise, with with the same icon. That is something you can now use and say, okay, looks like the people that took this kidnapped person are now associated with this icon. Right, the the game helps you generate ideas for it. So, I hope this makes sense. Let's go back here. And where's my icon relationship? Here we go. So I'm gonna have two with the emperor. 
let's do a plus two for positive with the emperor. And we'll do a negative one with the lich king. And for our one unique thing, let's say that I am the only uh, I'm the only person to have ever infiltrated I don't know if that's how you spell that the Lich King's inner sanctum right maybe I'm not there now maybe this will come into play somehow but this is helping me shape my character wow we're at like 40 minutes I can't believe Anyone will ever watch this for, for this long. If you're still watching this, hi, how are you enjoying our smooth jazz show? Okay, backgrounds. So this is the last thing we're going to go over. So backgrounds in 13th Age, the way they work is they basically replace skill checks in D&D. In so you know how in D&D you have the skills that are set skills that are also tied to all of your ability scores. So your athletics and perception and all of that. In 13th Age, you just roll the straight stats and you make up backgrounds that have to do with your character. Okay, so let's take a look at how skill checks work. So for to make a skill check, you would roll a d20, you would add the ability, the relevant ability modifier and your level, and then the number of points that you have in a relevant background. So the cool thing about this is that let's say that, you know, you're doing something that in in D and D would be would always be a dexterity check, even though it doesn't completely make sense for that thing. Like it, yeah, I don't know. Let's say you're trying to steal a horse, and you would say, okay, let's do animal handling, let's do stealth, which is fine. Here, let's say that you had a background that say that you were on the cavalry unit of the imperial guard, and the situation in which you're stealing this horse is less of kind of like a stealthy thing. It's more you're brute forcing your way into the stables, whatever. So the um, the GM might say, okay, give me a strength check. And then you would say, I was, you know, in this cavalry unit. I know how to handle horses. I want to add my cavalry unit background to this. And then maybe the GM will say, okay, tell us a little story about something that happened that would make this relevant, and we learn a bit more about your character. There are some examples here. So you can apply multiple backgrounds to the same check. The background with the highest bonus applies. If a character has both a traveling acrobat and a cat burglar, and both of them sort of applied to the same thing, she would just use the the higher one. Some other examples here, Arasak, this Kassarak has eight points to put into backgrounds, and they decide to put plus four in Imperial Mage, three in Tooth of the Black Fang, Assassin Training in the Service of the Black Worm, and one Wild Mountain Tribe. So you have eight points to put into these descriptive narrative backgrounds. So let's keep it simple. And we said that we are a half-orc ranger who used to serve in the Imperial Guard and then left the Imperial Guard to go after this artifact and double-crossed, you know, the Lich King's cults or whatever. So I would say, let's do, I want I want to do like a, a plus four in commander of the watch let's say let's say that this is something that is kind of like defined in our world and maybe this will help me in places where i need to like rally people or you like use tactics or stuff like that and let's put a plus three in i want something about like the fact that i i've infiltrated these these cults so maybe I would, if I had more time, I would think of like a cool name for this. But let's say infiltration specialist. I don't know. I wanted something like uh, to do a pun on waking the dead or something. I don't know. 
I'm I'm just talking for like 45 minutes straight. I've like completely lost track of, you know, time, space, what is going on. And I got plus one at cooking, right? And I usually like to do stuff like that because um, then I could also do stuff like, yeah, as the commander of a unit and the Imperial Guard, I used to always cook meals for my soldiers every time we got back from like a big mission or something. Even if it will not come into play, it makes for a cool story. And if you have a good GM, they will also lean into this and and put you in situations where this is relevant. Um, okay, I'm going to stop now. There's so much more that we can talk about. We can talk about incremental advances. We can talk about what happens when you level up. But this is the basics of it. We went through all of this manually, which I don't know if you'll actually do. If you play Foundry VTT, Foundry does a lot of this for you. If you want to see a video of how to do all of this in Foundry, which will be like a 10-minute video instead of like a 45-minute video, let me know. But I've been talking so much. I love you. Goodbye.